This is Dave, and I'm here with Ethan, and together we are Dave and Ethan's 2000-inch Weird Al podcast, episode 71-inch. On this week's episode, we discuss two documentaries Weird Al is featured in by speaking to Tiny Tim King for a Day producer Justin Martell and Vince Clementi, director of The Palindromists. It's Dave and Ethan's 2000-inch Weird Al it's a podcast about Weird Al. Seriously, the whole podcast is about Weird Al. You don't have to listen, but we're glad you are. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast. And yes, it is episode 17-inch. How do you feel about that, Dave? It's not episode 17-inch. Episode 17-inch was with Vicky DeVries about the Weird Al star fun. This is episode 71-inch. I think you're confused. You must have palindromes on your mind. Ah, uh, you're right, Dave. The brand new documentary, The Palindromist, just came out last week, and we've seen it, and we talked to the director this inch. That's right, but that's not our only guest's episode. We also talked to the producer of Tiny Tim, King for a Day, another great documentary that just came out recently as well. But before we get to those great interviews, we have some business to take care of, and that is, of course, chatting about last week's episode. Now, we got a lot of great feedback for episode 70 inch with Brian Hackney, the former program director at KCPR. And oh, yeah, he also won 12 Emmy Awards and all sorts of other things. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorites was our listener Zeb commented that he had no idea his local weatherman was so cool. <laughs> <laughs> How cool is that? You're listening to a podcast and all of a sudden your weatherman's on. You're like, wait, what's going on? And then you find out he has this great Al connection. And how cool is it to find out that your local weatherman is such a cool, awesome dude? <laughs> <laughs> it's so amazing. I wish Bob Kovacic was Weird Al's <laughs> program director. <laughs> what a cool thing. I don't know that I've ever really thought much about the life outside of the five minutes that the local weatherman is on, but that's pretty cool. You know, when you think about it, everybody's got a great story, and it's cool that we got to hear Brian's story. And it's pretty cool, too, because we got a couple email messages from people who were actually former DJs on KCPR as well. So they listened, they enjoyed it very much, and it was really cool to get to hear from other people from KCPR history. And of course, Brian is not our last KCPR alum that will be on the show. We have some more awesome interviews with other KCPR alums coming up soon. We also got some feedback from our friend and curator of the Weird Al Encompassing Song List over at weirdal.info, our friend Johnny O'Hearn. He said he was heartbroken listening to last week's episode. He heard me talking about my love for Wizard Burger, and he thought that a big breakup had happened but he was relieved when he learned that Wizard Burger is just part of Burrito Burrito. This week's episode is brought to you in part by vegan Mexican restaurant Burrito Burrito in Troy, New York, home of the two pound double wrapped in a quesadilla Burrito Burrito. Come on down to Burrito Burrito and Burrito Burrito your Burrito Burrito. Find them at burritosquared.com and at Burrito Squared on Instagram. And remember, not every burrito is a Burrito Burrito Burrito, but every Burrito 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 can be Burrito Burrito. And if you want to hear unheard clips from our interview with Brian, check out patreon.com slash 2000 inch. There is some bonus material from last week's episode, episode 70 inch with Brian Hackney that did not make the air, but it is really cool and you definitely got to hear it. Brian flips the script and starts interviewing us and it was so cool because we were being interviewed by a 12 time Emmy winner. How often does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> not very often, you know, maybe more often if you're. I don't know, Paul McCartney, but not if you're necessarily just Dave and Ethan, at least at this point in our career, before the Hollywood stars and all that. Speaking of the Hollywood star, I wonder if any of the messages on this week's 347 Spatula Hotline touch the Hollywood star. The 347 Spatula Hotline, the official hotline of Dave and Ethan's 2000-inch Weird Al podcast, is sponsored by Angel Valenzuela and David Cash, two amazing Weird Al fans and podcast supporters. Let's check out the first message. Hi, Dave. Hi, Ethan. It's Jackson Scoggins. I was just calling uh, from the future, actually. This is the year 2054, and we just did a seven-day festival all leading up to the premiere of Dill and Chill, the movie, 
as well as your immediate induction into the Hollywood Walk of Fame in the movie category. You know, you also, you got a, a Pulitzer in the film category. You know, it was screened at Sundance before, uh, at cons, all that stuff. Like I said, it was a seven-day festival. I mean, you didn't miss, up, miss out on much. You were here for all seven days. For some reason, Ethan finally gave in. And instead of sitting for 24 hours, he did the full uh, seven days at the star. I don't know, Ethan. Pretty brave on your part from, you know, the not wanting to do it before. But anyway, it was a great festival. And I uh, hope to see you guys at the radio induction in 2021. Have a good one, guys. Wow. Thank you so much to Jackson for calling in from the future. Who knew that so many of our listeners were time travelers? Yes, I am so excited to check out Gil and Chill the movie at Sundance right before we get that Pulitzer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited as well, and I hope that Jackson calls in from the future again for the rest of our star ceremony so I can help plan it so I know when I need to be in Hollywood next. I just hope he calls and tells me what I'm wearing so I don't have to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Now, it looks like we got another phone call here on the 347 Spatula Hotline. Hey, David Nathan. Uh, I'm a big fan. Um, I first discovered Weird Al back in December, and since then, I've gone through his entire discography, and I uh, plan on seeing him on tour next year, that is, if COVID um, ends by then. So, something interesting that I thought was kind of noteworthy was and last week on Thursday, not only was it the second anniversary of Weird Al star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame, but that was also my 17th birthday. Coincidence? I think not. You guys think maybe I was destined to be a Weird Al fan? Let me know. Ah, good question. What do you think? Is that a coincidence or is it meant to be? Oh, that is meant to be, Dave. That is no coincidence. Anyone who's a Weird Al fan, if you dig deep enough, you'll find out that your birthday matches up with some very, very special dates in Weird Al history. For example, I share the same birthday as Ruth Buzzy, who was in the Gump music video. Yeah, and okay, let's just throw a random example from last week. Say your birthday is on September 4th. You know, you may be like, oh, my birthday's on September 4th. That's not a special Weird Al day. But if you said that, you would be wrong. Oh, you would definitely be wrong because September 4th is the anniversary of many huge Weird Al events. For example, back on September 4th, 2010, the Internet Leaks Tour, I was at the Sherman Theater in Stroudsburg, PA, where I got to see Weird Al in concert. And also, six years later, you got to see Weird Al on the Mandatory World Tour at the Budweiser Summer Stage at Tags in Big Flats, New York. September 4th is also a big day in Weird Al recording history. There were not one, not two, but three songs recorded for the Mandatory Fun album, My Own Eyes, Lame Claim to Fame, and Mission Statement. And if that doesn't convince you, this one will. September 4th, 2019 was the air date of episode 18 inch of Dave and Ethan's 2000 inch Weird Al podcast featuring an interview with one Eric Roth. Eric Roth, one of the conductors on the Strings Attached Tour. What a fun interview. I'm going to go back and listen to that right now. So if your birthday was on September 4th, not only do we wish you a happy birthday, but we know you must be a Weird Al super fan. So let us know if your birthday correlates with any other Weird Al history. Give us a call, 347-SPATULA on the official hotline of David Ethan's 2000-inch Weird Al podcast. Let us know when your birthday is and let us know which Weird Al events it lines up with. Next week, we're going to be talking to one of the photographers from the upcoming book, Black and White and Weird All Over. Before we reveal that name, we need to talk about something very, very, very important. Well, you can only be talking about one thing that's very, very, very important, and that is our favorite website, shakewell.com, S-H-A-K-E-W-E-L-L-E dot C-O-M. Yes, of course. S-H-A-K-E-W-E-L-L-E dot C-O-M. My new favorite page. I know last week I was talking about chat, but this new page that I just love, it is 
fashion. Oh, the fashion tab on that website. That is so cool. I love that bouncing guy that's in like every single picture. Yeah, there's so many great fashion ideas. I know some people, some of our listeners may read Vogue magazine or, you know, one of those crappy magazines, but this is really the only place you need to go to learn about all of today's fashions. I mean, short, short Daisy Dukes with some weird women's blouse on this guy. I don't see where you could go wrong. And not only that, but you can click through each picture and you can see from every single angle. So you make sure that you are as fashionable as the people on shakewell.com. S-H-A-K-E-W-E-L-L-E dot C-O-M. And I also want to mention, you can see that the male model used in these pictures has even more fashion sense than anyone could imagine. He is ahead of the times. He uses two different types of socks. Wow, what a trendsetter. So amazing. All right, while I go reevaluate my fashion choices, there's a lot we have to get to this episode, so let's check out our very first guest. Dave and I are super excited to be talking to the producer and director of the brand new documentary, The Palindromist, which features Weird Al Yankovic. Please welcome Vince Clementi. How's it going, Vince? It's going great. How are you guys doing? Doing great. Did I say your name right? Vince Clemente, yeah, just like... Uh... My my uncle, I mean my fake uncle Roberto Clemente. <laughs> I was wondering if there was a connection there between you and Roberto. Uh, just just yeah, I mean that's a common question now. But, uh, no. <laughs> I do have a t-shirt jersey of this, you know, that I I think he wore. You know? <laughs> that's great. <Okay>, cool. <laughs> All right, so I need a little clarification because in your documentary the palindromist or the palindromist <laughs> there's two different <laughs> ways to pronounce that so which way are you going to pronounce that for our interview here uh well i mean i i seem to switch back and forth yeah. depending on <laughs> the day and my mood how fancy you're feeling <laughs> potato potato that situation uh, all right so either one is an acceptable way to pronounce that name of your film then. okay great <laughs> I was really excited to watch this documentary because I've loved Palindrome since before Al had the song Bob, and now after Al has had the song Bob, they're just so much fun. What got you into Palindromes, or, or what brought you into the scene? I mean, I, I grew up, I learned about Palindromes like we all do, you know, at the same time you, like, learn about, like, onomatopoeia and everything else. Just, right. like, grouped into, like, weird wordplay day at, in third grade. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so I never, you know, I never thought of it as like this thing that you could do. Like, you know, the teacher never gave us an assignment that was, that was like write a palindrome. You know, it might have just been like, you know, A, B, or C. What is this? What is unique about this sentence or something? And you have to say, oh, it's a palindrome. You know, and that was like the extent right. of what you learned about palindromes. <laughs> But you know, you don't know that you could actually write one and have it like be this like puzzle that exists in the world that you can just do at any time. You know, you don't need anything. There's, the rules are just use the language that you know some genius provided for us many years ago, and we just are stuck with this. You know, <laughs> so so for me it was uh, I was uh, out at dinner and I overheard a conversation happening behind me and it ended up being. Mark Saltfight, who was the 2012 world champion of palindrome, and I heard him say that he was the world palindrome champion. <laughs> and so I immediately was like, what? What the hell? You know, there's a palindrome championship? Like, I got I to gotta, I gotta know more about this. So, yeah, I struck a conversation with Mark, and, uh, you know, that was in 2012, and now eight years later, there's a film being released as of yesterday. So, uh, and my curiosity of the you know, being able to write them, you know. Have you ever written a palindrome yourself? Uh, you know, like with most documentaries, it's hard not to get like too involved with, yeah. <laughs> you know, the subject because you kind of obsess over it. So I was doing, you know, for a while there, I was trying to avoid writing palindromes, but you couldn't help myself. So I did, I did write one. I wrote a couple actually, but I wrote one that I sent to like the cast of it. And, you know, they kind of give me like a little pat on the back. Like, <laughs> you know, like, um, yeah. So, I mean, I think they appreciate it, but yeah. It was uh, God to help mass sample hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's a world champion palindrome right there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I should have saved it for, you know, the days when I start competing. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. 
I ended up making an image to go along with it because, as you saw in the film, it was like you know, if it doesn't have an image, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. So right. I just <laughs> yeah. I just took like the Last Supper photo and you know, you know, got rid of the body of Christ and put a hot dog in his hand. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Love it. But, uh, so obviously we got really excited when we heard that not only was their whole documentary about palindromes, but that Weird Al himself made an appearance in it. So I would love to know what gave you the idea to get Al in the documentary. Well, I said this in a, an article the other day that this whole movie was this big scheme for me to meet Weird Al, who's one of my heroes. So, <laughs> um, it was just very elaborate you know, scheme by myself. Because yeah, he's definitely like, you know, the first four... You know, five out of the first ten CDs I owned as a kid were Weird Al. Um, so he's definitely been a part of my life. And, you know, this, this movie's as quirky as Weird Al is. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, and he wrote a song that highlights, you know, some of the greatest palindromes. And it was just, you know, it makes made sense to put Weird Al in this movie. So, I, you know, I reached out to his team and, uh, you know, lucky enough, they, he was, like, so pumped, ready to get on it. Um <laughs> And was just happy to be a part of it, you know, something that he did. And he wrote the song, and uh, you know, he's fascinated with wordplay, as you can tell with his lyrics of everything. Yeah. So, so, yeah, he was just stoked to be in the movie. I was thrilled that Al shows up, like, nine seconds into the film. It was like, there's no waiting. It's not like we, we only get to see Al in the last five seconds. It is right up front we get to see Al, and I was hooked from that first nine seconds. I mean, yeah. When when Weird Al speaks, he you know the room quiet. You, know, you want to hear? You want to hear the uh, prolific thing he says? But yeah, he was great to interview. I mean, he I gave him the questions ahead of time, and he read all the questions, did his homework, and uh, he had answers. You know, he was ready, totally, total pro at this. Um, and you know, he I could tell that he sat with it and spent time thinking about each question that he was in the way in which he was going to answer it when uh, we. We had the interview, so mm-hmm. um, which I only had, you know, I prepared a, a list of questions for him, and I thought I had too many. I was like trying to go with as many as I could get, you know, because I only had I had thirty minutes with him. Cool. And so I ran out with like ten minutes left. So I was like, I gotta just keep firing questions. You know, <laughs> sure. I got, I'm, I'm talking to like my childhood hero here, so I just kept asking questions. And then after a couple of the you know, you know the random ones I was asking him. He was just like, these weren't in the thing you sent me, you know? So, <laughs> I got I got called out by Weird Al. <laughs> a badge of honor. <laughs> so when and where did you get to interview Weird Al? I interviewed him, I think it was, you know, four years ago now. Wow. Uh, but it, feel, it feels like yesterday, you know. Uh, but that was, you know, one of those moments where you're like, oh, now my life's complete. I got to hang out with Weird Al. <laughs> But yeah, I interviewed him in 2000, I think it was 16, and he gave me, you know, his uh, publicist or manager gave me a couple of days in which that he was available to do it, um, and I had to, also there was another documentary that was being made that was going to interview him about Gilbert Godfrey. Oh. Um, I don't know if that, I don't know if that one's out yet, but. So they linked me and the director of that film together, and we had to figure out a time that was in the afternoon and then Hollywood somewhere. So oh, we cool. had to find a space, and um, that was kind of all that you know I needed to figure out in order to make it happen. So it was at Busby's East on uh, Wilshire Boulevard in like La Brea. Anyone out there know where that is? I'm curious about what some of the questions were you were asking Al. Oh, I asked him like, what's his favorite palindrome? He responded with the uh, the letter O. Your favorite <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of it relied on like you know just like what he thinks about palindromes. You know, what what's the future of palindromes, stuff like that. Which in the movie is like the the final. The spoiler alert here, but the final. You know, <laughs> right. I think the final. It's the final thing you see is Weird Al in the movie, and he says, you know, if anything can save our civilization palindromes can so. <laughs> and, I, and i think he's absolutely correct so. <laughs> especially nowadays right <laughs> well now that the film is out was it all worth it to to get to hang out with al to put this whole oh, film yeah. together I'll, yeah <laughs> i would totally do it again <laughs> uh, yeah it was uh it was an honor to meet weird al i mean you, you know 
it's like something you never thought would happen right in, in your life you know <laughs> i mean you could see him go to his concert and look at him i don't know that doesn't really count as like shaking his hand and having a 30 minute conversation with him that was just a total dream come true for me <laughs> when i met him i was like you know like little worried you know and, you know anticipated and anxious yeah <laughs> i had no idea how tall he was but in my head he was like 10 feet tall like i was just like there's no way this guy's not 10 feet tall and uh, i ended up getting slightly taller than him so oh, I wow. Like, oh wow wow <laughs> I, I thought for sure he was going to be this gigantic guy that could just like pick me up and throw me around. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed all of the clips of Al in the documentary, and I, I thought there was some new information that I hadn't heard, including Al saying he wishes Poodle Hat could have come out in 2002 instead of 2003, so the year would have been a palindrome. Correct, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you write a palindrome song, you want it all to... <laughs> <laughs> coincide with that i mean john agee he, he talks about john agee he's a children's book author also palindromist palindromist john agee you know even wanted his upc code on his book to be a palindrome which i guess i don't think he got but he, he was pushing for it <laughs> <laughs> john agee is the author of the book go hang a salami i'm a lasagna hog yeah correct and weird al has said that he has used that book as inspiration for his song bob in fact he took pretty much almost all the palindromes as far as i know out of that book for bob yeah i mean it's strange that there's just these lists of palindromes and it's like who who knows who wrote which one kind of thing so like authorship is kind of a strange funny line with palindromes like you know at what point is their ownership of that so there was there was talk of that in the song not that like will weird al was uh you know breaking some kind of copyright law or something for palindromes, <laughs> but um it's just an honor to have your palindrome read, kind of like Doug Fink has his palindrome is in the song that he wrote. Uh, yeah, I love that, that Doug Fink, one of the palindromists that you're following through the documentary, says that he went to see Weird Al, and then Weird Al sings Bob, and he hears his own palindrome in the song. I love that so much. Yeah, I think there's no way you couldn't just burst out into immediate tears after, you know, <laughs> like, like, being knighted by Weird Al. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, technically he yeah. is like he has written a Weird Al song lyric, so that I mean that would go right on my resume if that were the case. <laughs> yeah. yeah, put that right on right on the top, you know. Yeah. That palindrome, Lisa Bonet ain't no basil. Yes, <laughs> love that. <laughs> <laughs> I was very surprised in the palindrome. I had obviously known that palindromes were words, you know, because I had listened to Weird Al's song. I had learned about palindromes in school, as you guys did as well. But I had no idea that there was things like palindrome poems and there were palindrome music pieces. So it was really an eye-opener to me to get to learn all this amazing stuff about palindromes that I had never even thought could possibly exist. So what other palindromes are there out there that we might not be immediately thinking of? Uh, I mean, there's palindromes and artwork, you know, um, mm -hmm. just kind of anything is anything can be a palindrome as long as it, you know, follows the rules of the forwards and backwards. So like objects in a certain position or, you know, there's this whole thing of like, uh, you know, the human face and beauty is like, you're more beautiful, you know, statistically, if your face is symmetric. So that's kind of like palindromic mm -hmm. and there's a lot of a lot of palindromes even in like within our dna um i i don't know completely that uh that part of it but there's like portions of our dna that are palindromic so wow. that is extremely interesting as well as uh you know just yeah music as you said you know words or word you can do words or letters by themselves so it's just this whole fascinating like just people in order you know i don't know what it is the obsession of creating this order but it's like magical when it something you know looks that way you know it's pleasing to the eye and the ear you know now i hope this isn't a spoiler i hope i'm not sharing too much but oh no there are a <laughs> lot of palindromes in the film <laughs> that's the spoiler but uh <laughs> stop one, it don't say that <laughs> one thing i really appreciated is anytime a palindrome was said it was written out on the screen and 
it was checked and then there's like a little noise to confirm yes in fact this is a palindrome and i loved that aspect and i was able to just trust when i heard the noise that i didn't need to actually like read it both ways and just like i can appreciate that this is in fact a palindrome i don't need to think about it too hard though so i appreciate you doing that well yeah i mean it, it, otherwise it would be you have to pause the movie and check right. it or right. listen to it and just like <laughs> like write it down to like you know make sure it's not fake news or something right <laughs> and i loved all of the animations throughout the film and i'm watching and i'm loving it and then the credits come up and it says that you did all of the animations can you tell us about that oh yeah totally i mean i work as a graphic designer animator as well so it was just there's all these history portions that you know obviously i can't go back to the great <laughs> library of alexandria but um which isn't in the film but it was in another animation that was going to be in the film about talking about um, you know the early days of reading and writing hmm. um but just to find out that there was all these other the times in history like the code breakers of world war ii having a secret palindrome competition mm-hmm. um you know the sator square um and then, you know, the, the whole thing with the Sator Square, the Tenet is in the middle of it, which was that now, that movie that came out, Tenet, the new Christopher Nolan movie. It was oh. just kind of uh, bizarre that palindromes are in, like, this light right now. It's a weird, <laughs> you know, like, who would have thought they'd have their day? Yeah, doing the animations was just a blast, you know, and then I kind of, uh, lucky enough, you know, John Agee and I worked together on a lot of those, and um, my style and his style are very similar, so it kind of melded together, like, we worked one day where it was maybe going to be John A.G. drawing, you know, like in real time, these things. We filmed that, but it ended up being a lot nicer looking to, uh, you know, spend weeks doing <laughs> those animations <laughs> and figuring out, like, how does it make sense, what to cut down, how to use all of Mark's knowledge and what was important, what was not important. How can I get from, you know, somebody talking about, uh, you know, Madame and Eve to Abracadabra. Right. Yeah, which Abracadabra is not an actual palindrome, but it has roots from palindrome, which is explained in one of the animations. What I love about this film is that you follow a group of people who are in this competition all about palindromes. Now, I would have never thought that this was a real thing, but it is. There's actually a competition that happens every couple of years or so. And they basically, you know, without giving away too much, they all have to create palindromes on the spot, given a series of you know, restraints that they have to follow. So it, it's very interesting. And what I love about it is that even in this little tight community of palindromists, that there is little scandals and things that go on as well, as you touched on in the film. Without giving away too much, there was this one palindromist who had written something and then it found out that he had published it years before and it became an issue and he ended up getting disqualified. And so it's just very interesting that there's this this hard set of rules in there and that there's interesting. But it, it really, in general, palindromes is a hobby that pretty much anybody can pick up, right? There's not that much you know, you need to do in order to become a palindromist. You just need to have, understand how to use words, correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, as long as you can read and write, I guess, or you, maybe you don't even have to read and write. You could be, you know, like a baby and just putting things in the palindrome way. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's really, yeah, anyone can do it anywhere. And, you know, as Bonnie Wynn, I'm his wife, one of the competitors says in the film that it's just, you know, it's a nice cheap hobby for your husband to have. And, right. You know where you know where he is at all times. He's just sitting on the couch writing palindromes. Uh, you know, just you need a pen and a paper. But I mean, you really could just do it in your mind if you wanted to. Um, but it sounds a little difficult. Uh, you know, it gets longer for palindromes. So, but yeah, doing this film, you know, I didn't know that there was a palindrome contest. I didn't know that you could write your own palindrome. And being a filmmaker, telling other people that I'm making a film about palindromes everyone kind of just is like what are you doing what what are you doing with your time like what is there to, what is there to say about palindromes i was like oh, just you wait you know let's you know, say you know maybe like a quarter of people wouldn't even remember what a palindrome was right. i have to tell them what it was i don't know that's kind of the inspiration you know like a negative reinforcement or something almost you know, you know like Pushing me like, oh, you, you don't think I can make a movie about palindromes? Watch, watch this. <laughs> <laughs> 
One thing I was excited about in the special thanks, of course, I saw the name Jay Levy, Al's manager, but then I also saw a former guest of the podcast in the special thanks, and that was Mike Kaplan. Yeah. And also another good friend of mine, Zach Sherwin. How were Mike and Zach involved with the film? Well, I actually did film, uh, you know, Mike, I think he has a PhD in linguistics. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then uh, Mike and Zach are obviously friends. And I had seen Zach perform his uh, Socrates rap, I think it is, before, uh, which is, you know, just talking about how I think Socrates' name is spelled backwards. I think it's Socrates. Maybe I might be wrong, but I had filmed them doing a podcast talking about palindromes uh, a while back and um, filmed them with Mike and Zach. And there was a third person there, um, which was going to be included in the film. And Mike and Zach also competed in a, a palindrome fight that uh, Mark Saltfight put on in, in Portland. Oh, wow. Uh, which is like a, a stand-up comedians. There's like four or five of them, I think. And um, they do their sets, but they also, while they're in between, they're, when they're not telling their jokes, they're in the back writing palindromes. And then they, you know, by crowd vote, they there's a palindrome fight winner. So <laughs> that was filmed, and that's, that's going to be on one of the special features. Oh, cool. Uh, so you'll see that, but... It became a thing where it was like to introduce a different tournament or, you know, palindrome tournament within the movie. And Mike and Zach, who didn't compete in the main tournament and just got to be too many characters and would have been confusing to the audience. So sadly had to uh, cut them out of the movie. But there's a special feature and it's awesome and I really like it. Well, I'm excited for the DVD to come out. That's awesome. That's right. DVDs are so cool, I think. (laughs) It's also a palindrome. So. That's right. <laughs> and your production company is a palindrome as well, I noticed. Correct, yeah. I mean, Kinnikinnik is a town in Colorado, and that's just kind of like when uh, I did a Kickstarter, and, uh, you know, it asked you where you're from, like what city. I was just I just picked, you know, the longest city available on their map. So that was a pounding. So that's kind of how that one came about. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> They didn't have, I, my first choice was Ikalaka Lake. <laughs> but I, you couldn't, you couldn't write that you were born in a lake. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did want to also ask you about your involvement in the Tetris World Championships. Oh man, you guys did your homework. <laughs> of course. And I love it. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, I could tie it together for you. Uh, in 2000, I've been running this classic Tetris world championship this is the 11th year so right now we're into it we're we're registering for that right now and it's just been this global sensation and you know we had some clips that went viral and now you know we were on espn and it's just become this whole like full-time job for me is running the classic Tetris world championship along with uh my co-producer on this adam cornelius who we you know made the documentary the order together which was the initial 2010 first championship that existed so hmm. and that happened in los angeles and the next one was in los angeles and the third palindrome contest in 2012 was in portland and so when i was in portland for the 2012 championship it was like after one of the days of the tournament i had gone out to dinner like 10 p.m or something like that and that's the dinner that i overheard mark behind me oh wow talking about the palindrome championship so they all kind of tie together. Yeah. And I was like, all right, this is the perfect excuse for me to meet Weird Al. I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have really great news for our listeners because they can watch The Palindromist right now. You can head on over to the palindromists.com and you, on there, there's links to watch it at the San Francisco Doc Fest from now until September 20th. And then on October 2nd, there's going to be the East Coast virtual premiere at the New Jersey International Film Fest. Very excited for that, especially coming to my home state of New Jersey. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and on the palindromist.com, there is great merchandise. I'm going to have to pick some up because, of course, the official poster does have Weird Alice name on it. So that's a collector alert for those of you who are listening. Vince, thank you so much for joining us. I do have one question, and you're not going to get away without answering this one, but what is your all-time favorite palindrome? I'm going to go with Mr. Ollie, my metal worm today. You know, I, I like to change it up, but that one, that, that kind of, that feels like what's going on today for me, so. 
Thank you so much to Vince. That was so much fun. And Dave, I loved that documentary, The Palindromists. Or The Palindromist, depending on how you want to pronounce it. <laughs> Both are correct, as we learned. That's right. That's right. <laughs> now, Ethan, I asked Vince what his favorite palindrome is. What is your favorite palindrome? I have to say my favorite palindrome is Bob. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be, right? <laughs> well, it doesn't have to be. It could be anything. It could be Uzi Rat in a sanitary zoo, but Bob's a good choice. Well. Yeah. Well, that was my second choice. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, we want to hear from you. What is your favorite palindrome? Be sure to visit our Facebook group, group.2000inch.com, and share your favorite palindromes. Now, another great documentary we've both seen very recently is Tiny Tim, King for a Day. I loved it. I learned so much. We are so excited for our next guest on the podcast. He wrote a biography all about Tiny Tim, and now he's the producer of a brand new film called Tiny Tim, King for a Day. Please welcome to the podcast, Justin Martell. Hey, Justin, welcome. Hello. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, well, thanks for joining us. Of course. What a great film. So thank you so much letting us see early copies of the film I thought I knew Tiny Tim, but turns out I only knew, like, the smallest, smallest fraction of his life and career. What an amazing documentary. Thanks. Glad you liked it. Now, what about Tiny Tim inspired you to make this documentary about him and write the biography as well? Um, I'll try to be as concise as possible. But basically, you know, my life only overlapped with Tiny Tim's for a very brief period of time. I was born in 1987. Tiny Tim passed away in 1996. I didn't live through Tiny Tim's heyday or even his years in the, the wilderness thereafter. Um, <laughs> and I first encountered Tiny Tim when I was actually seven years old. And there was a really great uh, Halloween theme park called Spooky World that was in Massachusetts. And if you're growing up in New England, at that time, if your dad said to you, we're going to go to Spooky World this weekend, like that was going to be a really good and fun weekend <laughs> if you were into that kind of stuff. And I went there and I remember very vividly when I, whether you were waiting in line for the Haunted Hayride, they had something called the Scaraoke Stage. And uh, Tiny Tim and Bobby Boris Pickett would come out uh, and do sets. Um, I remember going through the Haunted Hayride and then exiting into the gift shop. And I remember very vividly seeing Tiny Tim sitting next to Kane Hodder. Kane Hodder, who, of course, played Jason Voorhees in some of the later Friday the 13th films. Got Kane Hodder's autograph, but not Tiny Tim's. And didn't really... I mean, he was interesting enough to get my attention at that yeah. time, but I didn't really think you know too much about it. It was just like a you know, crazy-looking guy with long hair playing a ukulele. And didn't think about him again until I was in high school. And I just happened to hear Tiptoe Through the Tulips and was like, wow, what, what is that? That's so interesting and weird. And I, I'm, I'm kind of outraged by it, but I'm also really intrigued. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let me look this up. So I went on, you know, I went online. And uh, at that time, there was the Tiny Tim official website, which was uh, run by Tiny's widow, uh, Miss Sue tinytim.org it's not up anymore but it had a lot it was a really cool resource because it was you know before a lot of these recordings and videos and stuff were readily available and so there was just a lot of information about him and i was like oh wow like that's that guy that i saw at spooky world insane right and it was one of those things where i kind of then you know i, I dipped a pinky toe in and then like started seeking out and it was again before you could just go on youtube and listen to god bless tiny tim or really any of his albums or before we had uh, Apple Music and things like that. So I had to sort of then admit that I liked it and uh, ordered a copy of his first album, God Bless Tiny Tim, uh, off of eBay, dug out my parents' turntable, and they were horrified. And <laughs> that was like all I listened to for one summer, and I was totally a Tiny Tim obsessed fanatic and it was one of those things where i was like really excited about because i was like oh wow it's just you know this new discovery and this thing and not a lot of people talk about him and i just was i found that you know i was so enthusiastic but nobody else really was even older people who i tried to talk to you know every once in a while somebody would like perk up and be like oh yeah i loved tiny tim but still kind of saw him as like a curio and an oddity yeah but i 
immediately took to him as a, as a serious artist. Um, that first album, in my opinion, should be regarded as one of the top albums of the 60s. But we can get it and get more into that. So I just kind of, I don't know, it just sort of like throughout high school and stuff, it kind of just became this, mis this mission that I was on to like prove to everyone that Tiny Tim was actually a, while quirky and strange, actually a serious and talented and important and influential musician and personality of the 60s. And that, I guess, has brought us here today. Wow. Now, I, I'm assuming some of our listeners are thinking, what does this have to do with Weird Al? And, and we will get there, <laughs> of course. Uh, well, I mean, well, I mean, I, people should, I think anybody who would listen would agree that they are definitely, uh, if you look at a family tree, you know, Ty and Tim and Weird Al, you know, are both there, you know, maybe on different branches, but... I would say there's there's a relation. I think so, too. I mean, I think there's some similarities in that, yes, they both wrote music that could be seen as novelty or, or funny music. But I do think that they kind of went in these two very different directions. I don't know that Al ever has achieved that fame that Tiny had at the absolute height of his career. But Al's also sustained through his whole career where... As we learned in the documentary, Tiny really bottomed out and it, it wasn't a sustainable career by the end of it. Well, right. I would agree. And I think that's because, you know, you had you had Tiny's management in the 60s who were able to kind of get him into the mainstream and they they were not confident that he was going to be able to remain there. So they basically went for all the biggest gigs, biggest money, biggest appearances that they could possibly do to try and cash in on the fad before it. Um, you know, before it came out, it became out of style. I think Weird Al, of course, um, while a little more niche, has been able to identify that and yes, and maintain, as you're saying. But I think it's one of those things where they, they're similar in the sense that, I mean, I wouldn't even necessarily compare their music per se, but I would just say that, I would just say that they're similar in the sense that perhaps maybe like a mainstream perception of both of them could be that they're like quirky and weird and goofy and maybe not to be taken seriously, but underneath is actually some serious musicianship. And I think that they're kind of cut from the same cloth in that respect. Oh, absolutely agree. I mean, you, you touched on this a little bit, but I was going to ask you, you know, you only met the Tiny Tim briefly, but was he really crazy or was he actually a genius, in your opinion? I mean, okay, now this is going to be all who you talk to. I mean, there are some people who actually knew him who will tell you absolutely not. He was a total psychopath. Um, so, and then there are <laughs> other, but, but I, would, I would say it's more common, though, that people who knew him closely do say that he was a genius and um, I was savant you know, in a lot of ways. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I believe he, he was totally a, 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 a genius in the sense that he was a complete original and he was able to rebel against societal norms of the, as we were coming in from the fifties into the sixties, um, in a way that wasn't actually as confrontational, but maybe even more shocking than a lot of like rockers at the time. And, you know, I think that a lot of people now would watch Tiny Tim and think that it's not controversial. Well, why is that? Because you had Tiny Tim who set the precedent. <laughs> right. But when he came on to the, but when he came onto the scene in 1968, I mean, it was like a total shock when he made that first appearance on Laugh-In. And NBC, like, got, was flooded with, with mail asking, who is that guy? What is that thing that you had on? I, is this is what the world is coming to? Was that, that couldn't have been a real person? Was that a bigger, <laughs> so, was that a big celebrity in disguise? Uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, so I, I just think that, um, you know, he was a total uh, trailblazer in that sense and, and really doesn't get the credit that he deserves as kind of the first uh, androgynous, gender-bending, um, rock and roll era star. And I think that, you know, there's kind of even strange like overlap. There's like a lot of punk fans, for instance, who like Tiny Tim, a lot of Gigi Allen fans who like Tiny Tim because he's even kind of like punk rock in a sense. I mean, if you've ever gone on YouTube and watched Tiny Tim's version of Do You Think I'm Sexy on The Tonight Show where he like, you know, takes off his, uh, almost rips off his shirt and is rolling around <laughs> on the floor. If that's not... If that's not accidentally punk rock, like I don't know what that is, what that is, you know. <laughs> right. Um, so, so yeah, I, I just, you know, I, I maybe not a musical genius, but in the sense of an entertainer and performer, totally. 
where did your fascination with him turn into I'm going to become the expert on Tiny Tim and and once you decide to go down that path, how do you achieve that? How do you get this information <laughs> about Tiny Tim after he's already long gone at that point? Right. I mean, I would say that, and and there was not, I'm, I would say that there are, are slash were several experts. Uh, now, a lot of them, several of them were older than me and knew and worked with Tiny Tim. And I would point to a gentleman named Ernie Clark. Now, when I was first starting out, I was, I was like 15, 16 years old, there was a super fan named Ernie who did a lot of the groundwork for everything that we've been able to do now. And he was a, a kind of a reclusive guy, lived in Battle, Battle Creek, Michigan. Nobody had really ever met him, you know, rarely had met him or seen him, but he corresponded with Tiny Tim fans all over the world seemed to know kind of everybody involved in the Tiny Tim story. And he, he, you know, you were looking for a, a rare concert recording or a rare single. He had it, you know, and he had a dub of it. And he put together all kinds of compilations that he did himself, again, before a lot of this stuff got released on CD. So that was sort of where it started. And he was kind enough to, you know, talk to me and uh you know field my request and meanwhile my mother was like going insane because not only was i getting into tiny tim but then i'm talking to some like dude in battle creek michigan <laughs> you know about <laughs> old guy in battle creek michigan uh <laughs> about tiny tim and i remember actually i finally said to her would you like to listen in on my conversation next conversation with ernie so you can just hear and uh he didn't care my mom came on the phone and <laughs> and after that she you know realized it was fine yeah, but then there, right. but then there was like there was a small but dedicated network of fans, and Tiny and we were lucky enough that a lot of these people throughout Tiny's career saw it as important to document, you know, his his life and and you know every and career and even live performances with you know recordings, videos, photos, and luckily he was into it too because he. He would often say that, you know, well, you'll see when I'm gone, you know, that's when everybody will come, you know, calling and asking about me and things like that. So hmm. he was very much into having his life documented because we know, obviously, from the film that he uh, wrote uh, meticulously in his diaries from the 50s up until he died. And when I mean, he wrote every day, he wrote almost every detail, every perverted thought, everything wow. that ran through his head. The, the margins were filled with all kinds of random thoughts and anecdotes and, and things like that. And um, then he again, he was really into letting his fans and associates record him. And pretty, pretty much, you know, you could hang out with him and run a tape recorder the entire time. There are a lot of recordings like that or any phone call he'd be on. A lot of them start with he'll call somebody, they'll pick up and he'll say, Oh, hello, Mr. So-and-so. And they'll say, hi, how are you? And he'll say, have you got the tape recorder going? And they'll say, yeah, it's going. And then he'll say, okay. <laughs> As in the conversation. So that was, that was why there's where I was able to, and I, and, and that's what I did with my book. It was just that I came along and nobody had taken all of these pieces and put them together in a linear timeline. <laughs> and that's what I did with my book, Eternal Troubadour, The Improbable Life of Tiny Tim was I was able to take basically all of this material that was floating out there and collect it all and, and present it in a way that was digestible as one linear story. And then how does, you know, collecting this book lead to the documentary? So they, it was interesting because they kind of overlapped. So the book actually took me about eight years to write. I started it when I was in college thinking it was going to be an easy thing to do. <laughs> it wasn't released until 2016. But it was interesting, as I was writing the book, I started to get more involved with other projects such as releasing some posthumous you know, Tiny Tim albums that hadn't come out and recordings that hadn't come out when he was alive. So I was able to write some liner notes for some early releases such as uh, the 2009 album, um, I've Never Seen a Straight Banana, and then in a compilation of rare singles that came out in 2011 called Lost and Found Volume 1. And through that, Swedish documentary TV director and producer named Johan von Sydow, uh, just, I guess, saw my name floating around through some of these things, yeah. contacted me. And I had been, and then because I had been simultaneously researching and conducting interviews for my book, I conducted almost 100 interviews. Wow. He just said to me, he said to me, well, I'd like to make a documentary, you know, 
but I don't really have funding right now, but I'm often in America and in American cities on a, different assignments for TV. So why don't I just tell you where I am at certain times and you'll tell me who to talk to. And that's kind of how the documentary started to come together. So he'd be like, you know, I'm in LA, who should I talk to? And I'd wow. give him a list of people and kind of set up the interviews and essentially, um, you know, he would and kind of, you know, feed him some questions and things like that. Um, and then when the, and that was around 2012, that started happening. And I would say around 2016, when the book came out and Italian Tim was getting a little bit more press, Johan was able to secure some more funding. And that's kind of when we kicked it into high gear and were able to like get some of the bigger interviews that we had been needing, such as like actually fly, fly and travel specifically to places, not just because Johan happened to be there, um, such as Tiny's widow, Miss Sue, his daughter, Tulip, mm -hmm. um, and interviews like key interviews like that, that we needed to really round out the film. And here we are. So that's how that's how you go from the book, from from uh, whatever page to screen, or yeah. whatever the expression is. And and did I see you in the film both with and without a mustache? Yeah, you know, I think I'm with and without a mustache. You know, I think I gain I gain and lose twenty pounds. It's, yeah. <laughs> This film is very thorough about the life of Tiny Tim, and I think our listeners will enjoy it even without the Weird Al connection, but there is a Weird Al connection to this film. And Justin, will you tell us what that Weird Al connection is? Yes, Weird Al is the film's narrator, and he narrates as Tiny Tim, a reading from Tiny Tim's diaries. And he just did a really amazing job. I think he, you know, he played it totally straight. He didn't come in and try to imitate Tiny Tim or right. anything like that. And, um, yeah, he added a sense of um, humility to it. And I, I just think it was a total knockout. And, well, it was interesting trying to, uh, you know, convince the Swedish producers that uh, Weird Al was a great choice. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, they were, you know, they're like, you know, we should get Howard Stern and we're going to, you know, we're going to get Jim Carrey. And I'm like, I, you know, you could try. I don't know if that's going to happen. <laughs> uh, but I'm just really glad that that we that we landed on that, because, again, I, I you know, I, I, I agree that that they are very different in some ways. But I, I really do see them as uh, artists sort of from the same the same family tree. So. And, and I think that, you know, Weird Al agreed to, to a certain extent. And the, um, the recording session we, we did in L.A., and that was pretty fun. He, uh, he, Weird Al, he came, he, he drove himself to the, to the session, and um, I was able to tell him about when I saw him live in Atlanta on April 22nd, 2004. Wow. <laughs> uh, when I was about uh, 16 or 17. And um, he told me actually that he remembered, well, okay, it was kind of what I really remember about that night was, and I don't remember the name of the, of the comedian who opened for him, but he had like a stand up comedian that opened for him. Okay. And it was right around the time Dale, uh, NAS, the NASCAR driver, Dale Earnhardt, unfortunately passed away. And the, this stand up comedian bombed horribly. And started to get booed by the audience and knowing that he was not going to recover uh from where he from the depths that his uh act had had sunk to there um he he just he just said screw it and he turns to this southern audience and he goes all right well i'm gonna wrap it up but let me just say this dale earnhardt deserved to die Oh and I mean, the, the like the anger that erupted from that crowd and he got and he literally like ran off that stage. Whoa. And then the announcer came on and said, you know, the headliner would like the audience to know that the views expressed by the opening act. You know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, but Weird Al didn't remember that. Uh, he remembered, though, that Guar had actually played the night before. And the whole time that they were – that during that concert, he kept stepping on blood packets. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. So that was in the uh, Poodle Hat tour, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was definitely the Poodle Hat tour. And I loved that album, too, uh, with Bob and uh, eBay, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she favorite cuts. So, uh, but yeah, so it was cool. It was cool to be able to tell him that, and um, you know, the we did the the voiceover. I would say in about two days, you know, 
and he just was it was really went really smooth and he was totally into it and we got to take a great photo together with uh with my book and i, I gave him a tiny tim pin and he was cool. on his way <laughs> so how much was recorded with al i mean the the film's only so long I, i'm just trying to think like with two days did he read all of the diaries or what was the process of recording and, and editing well he did record a little bit more than than we used and he you know we just did multiple takes and he did try some different deliveries delivery before we kind of settled on what you hear in the film mm -hmm. um there were there were also a couple of things i would just say i hope he doesn't mind me saying it but that he he also just didn't want to read <laughs> you know so oh. there was some discussion <laughs> about that or you know there's the part where when the film where we're discussing tiny's marriage his first marriage to miss vicky on the tonight show and he's reading tiny's diary entry where he's kind of like you know, outlining to himself, that, you know, the things that he's going to do as, as a husband in the marriage. Mm. And he's saying, I need to remember to eat her constantly and, uh, Jeez. you know, use, <laughs> use various uh, things in bed, like, uh, honey and mustard and things like that. Wow. And he kind of <laughs> said, uh, you know, do I have, do I really have to read this? And uh, <laughs> I don't blame him. <laughs> luckily. Yeah. Yeah. I don't need, I don't either. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad he did it. Yeah, I mean, that there's that one part in the film where it's like, it's kind of Al reading a bunch of different things at the same time. And I was wondering, you know, how much went into that? How many different things did you have to record to be able to create that amazing effect? You're talking about kind of towards the end where we're getting to Tiny's a uh, little down and out, living living yeah. in, in the mid in the yeah. Midwest. Um, that was, so what, we, what actually what those were, were in Tiny's diary. So... A little bit of background about the diary. So the diaries were the backbone of my book. Um, I have, now I have about 25 of them. But when I was writing the book, I had 22. And they dated from the 50s up into the late 70s with a few years missing in between. But I pretty much wow. had, in particular, the crucial years from like 67 to 71. And these were the literal diaries or were they photocopies? No, 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 no. These are the actual diaries. Wow. I, I still have them. And where I got them was one of Ti the son of one of Tiny's managers had them. He was living in the Ozark Mountains in Arkansas. So somehow they made it from New York to Arkansas, and they were in his basement. And he contacted me around 2013, said, I have these diaries, but I'd like to do the right thing. And because when my family knew Tiny, he was married to Miss Vicky, his first wife, I would like to give these diaries to her. And I would just like to point out, and this is not to dispar disparage Vicky in any way, but I would just say that she's not at this point particularly interested in, you know, I would say maintaining Tiny's legacy. She kind of just wants to move on with her life. Right. So she, she said to me at the time, though, she said, uh, so, uh, you know, I facilitated getting them from him to her. And so then they, they moved from where he was in Arkansas to where she lives in Tennessee. And she said, OK, well. Either I can have a bonfire with these diaries, or <laughs> oh. you, or you can make me an offer uh, for them. And she didn't gouge me on the price, so I said, "Let me write you a check." Wow! And she sent those over. And so now, going back to your original question about, there's that point in the film where, like, you know, there's all these like kind of little snippets and like seemingly like out of place, like quotes that that Weird Al's saying, and that and they're all kind of just talking over each other, yeah. trying to show what was going on in Tiny's mind and the kind of, I don't know, the, uh, um, how should we say it? His, his unrest at the time. Yeah. And what that was is he would just write like these little, sometimes inspirational sayings, sometimes kind of dark sayings. And he would scribble them in the, in the margins of his journals. So it was like, you know, you know, hang in there god's got a plan and then it then on the next page though written in the margin it would say um i can't do it alone anymore things like that so we isolated a bunch of those little things that he had scribbled at various points in diaries and had weird out read those off and so that's how we got that wow yeah that that was a great part thanks were you involved in actually getting Al secured and what was that conversation like? Uh, I will say that that was actually something that was done by the producers from Sweden and that's Memento film. 
Yeah. And they that was the kind of things. Those are the types of things that they were really um, involved with. I was, of course, more involved with like the Tiny Tim end, arranging okay. those interviews, getting those archival materials and things of that nature. But I don't, don't know too much what it was like in terms of negotiations. But I think uh, they came back fairly quickly that he wanted to do it. I don't think it was necessarily a long negotiation process. And, you know, and, and of course, they had known each other a little bit. Uh, they both performed at the same TV special in the late 80s, the Dr. Demento Comedy Central TV special. I don't know if the two, if, I don't know if you've seen that, but they're both on the same special. And I know that they met there. And then there's that photo of the two of them together, um, I think with uh, Fred Schneider from the B-52s as well. I think he's also there. And Weird Al shared that a couple of years ago and said, here's proof that me and Ty and Tim are not the same person. <laughs> so I, I, I don't, do, you know the, do, do you know the post I'm talking about? Yes, no, I do. I, I have seen that picture, and, yes. Yeah, and, and I think probably, I think Weird Al probably finds it funny because there's been, there's certainly probably been points during his career where people definitely mistook them for the same person. Actually, here's another funny story from the recording session. I just asked him, you know, did you, did you, you know, how many times did you meet Tiny, things like that. And he recalled doing that Comedy Central Dr. Demento special together. Um, but he said, you know, one time, I was at a Ringo Starr show here in L.A. And he's like, I'm not sure if Ringo was joking or if he was serious. It could, I could have been either one because I said because he goes, I was really it was pretty early in my career. So he might not have known who I was, but I was at a Ringo Starr show and suddenly Ringo stops the show and he goes, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to have a big, we have a big star in the audience tonight. I want everybody to give a big hand to Mr. Tiny Tim. <laughs> <laughs> And, and pointed at Weird Al. Um, wow. Yeah. So I don't know. So I, I certainly got the impression that there was at least, um, you know, while he might not have been a huge, like, follower of Tiny Tim, and I wouldn't even go so far as to say that Weird Al necessarily, like, was inspired by or, or borrowed anything from Tiny Tim. I think I got the impression that there was certainly an appreciation there. Yeah. Yeah, and, and there's a, a very slight physical resemblance between the two of them as well. That and sometimes some of the faces made during performances, you could you could like line up the two and the similar <laughs> similar funny faces. <laughs> Dave and I are are two giant collectors of Weird Al memorabilia. And it sounds like the kind of stuff that you've worked on putting out for Tiny Tim is exactly the kind of stuff that we would love to have released officially in the Weird Al community. I'd love to hear about some of these albums and the, the Edison wax cylinder. I would just love to hear about all this stuff. It sounds so cool. <laughs> well, okay. So I think the first posthumous release that, I mean, it's just one of those things where he, for a, for a supposed one hit wonder, he was totally prolific and he would just record with anybody you know where you know he could be somewhere in alabama and some you know teenager could come up to him and say you know i'm a young record producer can i take you into the studio and he would say oh sure mr so-and-so you know and then there'd be a tape there'd be a tape from that that never got released and you know there's all kinds of these recordings there's still a lot that haven't come out that i'm slowly working on bringing out but what has come out is in 2010 i teamed up with uh, new york musician uh, and frontman of the 80s group, the Bongos, Richard Barone. Mm -hmm. And he, kind of similarly to the example I just gave, when he was 16 years old and Tiny was playing at a Travel Lodge motel in 1976, approached Tiny similarly and brought him into the studio and basically recorded a whole album of Tiny just with his ukulele. And he had the tape still, so we went into the studio and did some overdubs and kind of finished the album. I think it came out great. That's I've never seen a straight banana. That was released on Collector's Choice on CD in 2009 or 2010 mm -hmm. to four and five star reviews across the board. Of course, there is the LP only 2011 compilation, Tiny Tim Lost and Found Volume 1. That's a collection of rare singles from, the, from before Tiny's mainstream recording contract with reprise records and also a little bit after 
And then with the wax cylinder, that's Lost and Found Volume 2. And what that is, is we haven't really touched on yet that Tiny's repertoire was mainly comprised of songs from the early 1900s. I would say from like 1890 to about 1920. And a lot of those songs were old Edison cylinders because he spent hours and hours while he was developing what ultimately became Tiny Tim at the New York Public Library, listening to these old Edison cylinders and all these old songs from the turn of the century hmm. that, they had, that they had there in their archives. Hmm. And he had always wanted to release a song on a cylinder record and had always said that he pitched that to so many different record producers. But obviously, before the digital age, releasing something on an obsolete format didn't make sense right. now that we live in the di now that we live in the digital age and such a release can be a collector's item then it makes sense so in 2013 we released tiny tim lost and found volume two uh nobody else can love me love me like my old tomato can and that was a an unreleased track that would have been recorded in australia in 1974 and we actually made about 50 um new Edison wax cylinders with that track on it that actually does play. I don't have a player, but when we released it, when we released it, some people sent me them playing it on their players. And we we, we found a guy who can make them. What he does is he, he takes, uh, he's called the Victrola guy, and he takes uh, Edison wax cylinders that are too moldy to play and shaves them down. And then he has his own setup. And he's fairly, there's only like three people in the world who can make Whoa. new cylinders now. So wow. they're all like, very secretive about their methods. So he shaves them down so he can write new grooves onto them. And that's how we did it. And we, we replicated the, if you look at the packaging of it, it looks very much like, a, like if it had been released in the Edison cylinder era, what the packaging would have looked like. Wow. And that's just something that he wanted to, had wanted to do. So it wasn't like it came out of nowhere, like, okay, how can we be as, as hipster about this <laughs> right. as possible? Let's put the, you know, let's put Tiny Tim on a wax cylinder. No, it was born out of the fact that he sang songs from that era and he always wanted to do that. That's so, so that's cool. that's why it was. And it's funny you bring that up. I saw somebody has a copy on, there was only 50. Someone's selling a copy on Amazon for 600 bucks. Whoa. <laughs> it's just so <laughs> <today. Wow. laughs> I'm definitely going to be looking up that Edison cylinder. I, I just want to see it. <laughs> yeah, there there are pics of it. And then it, the, the tracks, the track is actually on like Spotify and Apple Music and all that. And the and the file that's up there is it being played through a... Oh, cool. Uh, okay. Machine. So, you, so you'll be oh, able wow. to hear like... Be able to hear because that's like, I, you know, I don't know how much you knew about like Tiny Tim and like the turn of the century stuff or whatever. But that's like why he has that like weird warble in his voice because he's a guy who taught himself to sing listening to like old 78s so when he sings and there's like that like crackle and like warble in his voice it's almost because he like um like sucked in like those sounds you know it was mm -hmm. like recreating them wow so oh, and wow. so That's so, so wow. yeah so and so tiny tim coming through being played through an edison cylinder actually sounds incredibly natural I think you would have like totally flipped out about it. <laughs> That's so cool. Wow. <laughs> and then uh, let's see what's what's happened since then. Then there was in 2016 another similar thing. We released the LP Tiny Tim's America, um, and all of these things that I'm talking about have actually also come out on digital, so people can go on like Apple Music and Spotify and stuff and, and find these. Um, <laughs> and Tiny Tim's America. Um, we released on a uh, vinyl and that was a, we found a demo tape that Tiny had recorded in 1974 in his hotel room and took it, went into the studio with uh, Richard Barone, who I mentioned producing the sessions and actually Tiny's cousin, Eddie Rabin, who's a well-known uh, piano player here and, and arranger here in New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was Eddie, Eddie arranging and, um, you know, conducting the musicians for the overdubs. And we, I guess it was one of those things where we finished that album. And most recently, actually, at the end of 2019, we put out a CD that was called Tiny Tim Spirits of the Past. And that was a hotel room recording. That one we didn't alter at all because the fidelity was such that it just kind of had to be left at is, as is. But that was a private hotel room concert that Tiny gave to his fan club president, Rita McConaughey, Whoa. in 1969. Wow. And that's called Spirits of the Past. Um, and that's, oh, that's cool. out. So 
Yeah, and the last couple ones that I mentioned have all come out on my label, which is called Ship to Shore Phonoco. And we don't just do Tiny Tim. We do video game soundtracks, movie soundtracks, other classic reissues and stuff like that. Yeah, I was checking at the site. It's really cool. I, I think I'm going to be picking up a Tom Green soundtrack. It looks really cool. <laughs> that, was a fun, that was a really <laughs> fun one to do. And we shot a music video for that in Vietnam, and that was just an absolute trip to be over there with Tom Green. Wow! Talking about other like childhood, you know, things coming, <laughs> coming true. Um, but uh, but you know, it's one of those things where like I have to reel myself back with the record label because what I want to do is I, I'm sitting on so many Tiny Tim recordings that I want to release, and let's you know, let's face it, you know, there's a limited market for that, and I you know, but it's always like I have to like hold myself back because I've always wanted to just focus on and put out new tiny Tim releases yeah. for myself and like 10 other people. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Well, I really am excited for everyone to see tiny Tim King for a day. I know uh, it recently premiered at the Fantasia film festival in Montreal and it should be premiering in other cities eventually. And I know there's going to be a home video release next year I am just so excited for people to, to get to see it because, like I said, it, there's so much about Tiny Tim that I never knew. And now I want to hear, you know, the Lost Records. I want to go back and listen to the first album again and, and really dive into Tiny Tim because he's such an interesting guy with such an amazing story. And bravo to you, Justin, for digging up these old diaries and, and putting it together and really paving the way to a, a better understanding of, of Tiny and his career. Thank you. I'm just, I'm glad that people like it and are interested in it and it gives me a reason to keep doing it. So we can check out your website. It's godblesstinytim.com. And uh, there's also a very active Tiny Tim fan page on Facebook for people who want to get into the community. And what, what do you call people who are, are big Tiny Tim fans? Well, I, re I used to call them Tiny Timophiles. Uh, but somebody, <laughs> people thought that that was a bit of an odious uh, nickname. So, so the re the recent one that has been suggested to me, which I've been using, is Timnians. <laughs> love it. Timian, I love it. <laughs> and I highly recommend people t checking out Eternal Troubadour: The Improbable Life of Tiny Tim, Justin's book. Justin, thank you so much for joining us. This was really, really amazing to chat with you. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much to Justin Martell for that great interview. I think that Justin is the Dave and Ethan of Tiny Tim. He's got to be, right? I think you're right. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I just couldn't help but think about what you and I would do if there were, you know, old diaries written by Weird Al. I think if they were being threatened to be burned by Al's <laughs> ex-wife, I think we would be the ones writing a check and saving them and preserving them and making documentaries about them. Now, that was really awesome. Thanks again to Justin. And fun fact, our listener, Jackson Scoggins, actually hooked us up with Justin. They are friends. Yeah, very cool. Justin told us off the air that they met through the Tiny Tim community. So how awesome is that? But Jackson, do not let your love of Tiny Tim get in the way of planning our star ceremonies. You know, each week we can bring you this podcast absolutely free. Thanks to sponsors like Burrito Burrito, Angel Valenzuela and his son, David Cash, Jackson Scoggins, and our amazing Patreon supporters like Dave, Calvin, and so many more. Patreon helps us pay the bills and ensures that we can continue to do what we love, and that is making fun, family-friendly, entertaining Weird Al podcasts for you each and every week. Please join us in thanking all of our supporters over on patreon.com slash 2000inch for making this podcast possible. And please consider joining our Patreon family for as little as $1 per month. And very soon, you get to hear those bonus outtakes from our interview with Brian Hackney. Another way to support the podcast is by purchasing merchandise from our official Dave and Ethan's 2000 Inch Weird Al podcast merchandise shop. We just got some brand new items in the shop and they are absolutely amazing. There is a fanny pack with the Dave and Ethan's 2000 Inch Weird Al podcast logo on it. And there's a face mask and there's tights. 
And there are finally official Dave and Ethan's 2000 inch We're Now podcast neckties. Uh, those are socks, Dave. Are you sure I've been wearing them as a necktie? Well, whatever floats your boat. Head on over to shop.2000inch.com for all those great items and much, much more. Thanks again to Vince Clementi, Justin Martell, and all of our listeners, subscribers, Patreon supporters, and sponsors. And thanks to everyone who follows at 2000 Inch on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Be sure to do your part and tag fun Weird Al or podcast-related posts on social media by using hashtag 2000 Inch and hashtag Gill and Chill. And if you haven't already, you absolutely need to join our Facebook group by heading over to group.2000inch.com. We have lots of fun discussions there, post exclusives. It's so much fun you can find us online at weirdalpodcast.com or 2000inch.com make sure you share our posts tell your friends about the podcast and we absolutely love it when you leave us messages on our 27 hour a day podcast hotline 347 spatula you might even hear your message on the air and don't forget to include your name when you're leaving a message You already know where to find us, but do yourselves a favor and head on over to Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Pandora, or the podcast app of your choice and hit the subscribe button. That way you don't miss a single episode. And if for some reason, some ungoshly reason, your favorite podcast app does not have Dave and Ethan's 2000 inch Weird Al podcast. One, I question why you like that podcast app so much. And two, please tell us and we'll make sure that it gets added. We are very excited for next week's guest. Not only was he a DJ at KCPR, but he was also a mainstay on the Dr. Demento show for many years. And he was a witness to history as he was on hand for the live performance debut of Another One Rides the Bus. We are very excited to talk to the one and only Beefalo Bill Burke on next week's episode. Yes, and one of his photos does show up in the amazing Black and White and Weird All Over book, which you can pre-order now by heading over to blackandwhiteandweird.com or blackandwhiteandweirdallover.com. Are you sure that these aren't neckties? I mean, they're a little bit tight. I probably should have ordered a larger size. And it was a little odd that they did come two in a pack. That was Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al Podcast, episode 71-inch. Weird Al narrates Tanya Tim's diaries, and I think he just did an absolutely amazing job. And again, oh, sorry, my cat's meowing here. Hey, stop it.